Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Yacht Crew Vlogs right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Rhea. I am your host, and I am pleased to welcome back Tom Worthington from TAM Asset Management. How are you, Tom? I'm good, thank you, Rhea. How are you? Good, considering the state of the world all around. <laughs> um, you know, every every morning you wake up is a good one, so I, I can say I'm good. There you go. That's a nice, positive way to look at it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Something that I don't think people realize every single day, we're hearing people talking about masks. We're hearing people talk about lockdowns. We're hearing people talk about restrictions, um, health, vaccines, et cetera. But no one's actually addressing finances. And, you know, it's interesting to see if you follow, you know, financial markets, there has just been an up and a down. I'm not sure that there's been any you know, and I guess normally the, the financial marketplace sort of just moves up and down very slightly, but that hasn't really been the case, has it, throughout this period? No, it's been a spectacularly, spectacularly unpredictable market in a lot of ways. There's big movements in tech. Those can be justified now. But obviously, in January, you wouldn't say that Amazon would increase its net value by 70%. You know, it, that would have been an obscene call to make. Um, neither would you have said that, you know, some of the major airlines would be looking for bailouts, including Virgin, Jet2, cancelling holidays. You wouldn't have said Mallorca would be 75% down on the tourism. There's a lot that was not obviously foreseen because it's an unprecedented thing. And I think. You're right, people aren't really talking about finances when, in fact, finances are worrying a lot of people at the moment. Um, not necessarily, obviously, there's both sides of the coin. People will be worrying about maybe if they have got investments, what the investments are doing. Um, and then there's the flip side where people are worried about income, about surviving, about jobs about the economy, you know, uh, micro economies in the Balearics are, have taken a huge hit and probably will take, continue to take a, a big hit. Um, even yachting, which was almost seen as untouchable, are seeing, you know, yachts being reduced to smaller crews. They're seeing wages, um, well, owners asking for wages to be cut. Um, yeah, everyone's having to tighten the belt, even the people with the huge, huge toys that a lot of uh, the yacht crew work on. Well, let me ask you, um, when it comes to the crew, you know, we see that a lot of insurance companies now aren't covering anybody with travel, etc. With crew, when they have been locked into some sort of investment over the past few years, and something like this happens, which is completely unprecedented, um, how are they able to, are they able to pull themselves out of some of their investments, or do they have to continue to pay that monthly installment into these investments, or does it just depend on the company? You know, what kind of headaches are they facing right now? Ouch, that's a hard question. Um, it all depends on what they signed up for. Um, and I kind of think this overlaps to a, a topic that's been raised recently um, by an article that we, we were just discussing before we went uh, on record. And also, we've been discussing a, a couple of times on air. A lot of the things that people who signed up for do not allow the flexibility to obtain what you might expect out of your investment when you need it, um, which is the whole idea behind the Seafarer Saver, which obviously um, is on your website and um, it's on seafarersaver.com, was to give... <laughs> the idea behind it was, first, we know that yacht crew need to be flexible. The theory behind it was they need to be flexible because owners can fire crew at the drop of a hat, you know, an owner can pass away and sell or sell the boat. Um, you can get injured, so you can't work. Um, all sorts of things can happen. You might want to buy a house. You have a kid. You 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 might need another course. All of a sudden, um, we thought we'd have to make it flexible for those reasons. We never thought we'd have to make it flexible for a global pandemic. Now. The fact that it is flexible obviously plays in the favour of the people that have invested with the Seafarer Saver. 
because if they do need it, they know. And we have had withdrawals. And in fact, we've had a couple of cases where people have said, you know what, I've got X amount in it. Uh, could you just make sure I've got, I don't know, say 10,000 in cash start at the side? I might not take it out, but I just want to know it's there in case, because when we, obviously there's no penalties and no early withdrawals with us. However, we need time to get out the market, which can take up to a week or two. So, so we do say, you know, if you can give us a week or two notice, that means everything runs a lot smoothly. And a few clients have actually said, we just like a little bit of portion just there that we know that if we press the button on it, we can have it within a day or two. So we're seeing that, which never really happens apart from when you're purchasing an asset. Maybe if you see a new house, um, possibly a new car, and they, they will sometimes give that kind of instruction. But that's also something that quite kind of very new. And luckily through a CFR saver, you can do it. With other investments, liquidity is key. Um, but liquidity isn't just on what you invest in. So anything you want to be invested in, something called a use tip, which is a type of fund, but you want it to be daily traded so that if you need to sell it, you can sell it that same day which is everything that we trade, for example. Now, you can be an investment, still be in those kind of funds. However, so the investment might be a good investment. It might have been set out right. However, the product that the investment's held in, within might not allow for that flexibility. So they might have a five-year term, a 10-year term. We've even heard, unfortunately, of 20 or 25-year terms, which means if you withdraw before that, there's quite substantial penalties to be paid. Um, we, I mean, I could go on and on. Um, in terms of yacht crew, um, we tend to see a lot of things go like the second car, or the motorbike, or the toys. Um, even unfortunately, you know, the electric scooters. But, um, when it comes to yacht crew, it's the, uh, so to yacht owners, it's the same. They're having to get rid of boats and get rid of crew. On the flip side, it's it's a very, it's somewhere that we were in March, which was called the Dash for Cash. Everyone wanted liquidity, and it seems like everyone is doing the same again in possibly in an anticipation for a second lockdown. Because if we do have a second lockdown, obviously, we'll probably experience a second, second recession in the markets. For how long, we don't know because, I mean, at time we're already making money year on date. So most of our portfolios, if, if you were at the start of the year, you'll either be breaking even or be in positive. So that can be wiped off again. Um, it's just a very, very uncertain time with anything to do with financial, whether it's personal, whether it's ownership work, uh, and to be honest, global. Well, you know, something that I noticed um, throughout this period was that a lot of the financial magazines were reporting that the wealthiest among us were actually making money hand over fist, while those of us that were middle to lower class were actually losing the shirts off our backs. Is there any validity to that? I mean, media love to make people hate um, because it, it creates readers. Um, now, there's, yes, there's validity in some of it. Um, I might be slightly off here, but I think Amazon went from a net worth of 118 billion to around about 180 billion over the, from March to July, the end of August. Um, Microsoft increased because things like Teams, which is you know a team viewer where you have online meetings, went up incredibly in value. We're now seeing that the fact that people don't want to go to supermarkets the same. They don't want to go into, you know, big hardware stores or to big shopping centers and do a shop that they can do just as easily from home. Um, and people are starting to realize that tech has the advantages of, you know, a food shop's a little bit different. That might take a little bit longer. But if you go, let's say, to buy a power drill, well, you, you pick up five power drills, and unless you know which one you're going there to buy, you're taking a bit of a gamble if you don't know the make or the power or what it does. 
Whereas you buy it on something like Amazon or, or online store, you can get reviews. You can say, well, it's 600 watts. What does 600 watts mean? What's the perforation? What's this? What's that? What's that? Things like that you don't get in the store. So people are starting to come around to the fact that they're starting to be forced to see the advantages rather than to discover them on their own. And like throughout history, the biggest time of innovation is war, usually, where we create new technologies, we create more advances in certain fields, certain technologies, um, certain manufacturing processes. Now, unfortunately, this isn't a war, but it's a similar situation for tech because people aren't allowed to integrate. So they're forcing everyone to do everything from home, or well, not forcing, but encouraging, and not only encouraging, people are happy to do it because one, they're scared, two, they might not be allowed to go out, and three, it's actually sometimes a better experience than what they were used to. So they're breaking the habit of maybe, you know, since they were brought up going, and doing something in a certain way, when you're forced into a new way, it can often be a better way of doing it. So while newspapers love to say, right, these guys are making hand over money hand over fist, they're doing it by facilitating their customers. So it's a two-sided story. I'm not going to take a side on it, but you can't call them evil when you are using them because it's more convenient for you, for the shopper as well. Right. Well, I, I don't think necessarily that, uh, you know, people were thinking they were evil, but it definitely does make sense the way you speak about it, because, of course, and, you know, the amount of, of you know, on social media uh, memes that were coming across, you know, with the UPS driver from Amazon and, and, you know, today I'm buying 20 things on Amazon that I don't need. And people were a lot of people were bored and just buying things. And, and like you said, again, everything to do with the tech world definitely would have risen because we were all stuck at home doing everything kids were doing school from home um you know they needed the internet they needed computers um, they needed all the gadgets that went with those computers so it just goes to it's obvious that those companies would go up in value one thing that we have not touched on at all at all since this whole lockdown and pandemic and everything else has happened is brexit I mean, we are heading into an absolute no deal Brexit and nobody is talking about how this is going to affect the world in general, let alone how it's going to affect crew. Um, you know, there's a lot of crew from the UK and from Europe uh, that have invested in, you know, things in, in England. Um, but, you know, most of these crew of the age where their whole lives, England has been part of Britain, has been part of Europe. What's going to happen with those investments once Brexit is done? Um, it's a very it's a very tough one to predict because no one, including the people at the top that usually you know, knows what's going to happen. Um, you're right; a lot of crew are British, um, or a lot of crew have British affiliation. Um, I believe. One of the interviews you're doing soon is uh, with Patrick. Um, he deals with a lot of UK crew. For example, he, he he's on the tax side, but when you're considering um, people with investments such as, I don't know, an ISA, um, a property, a savings account, things like that, all these things are going to change. When you're talking about bigger portfolios as in... Um, excuse me, so that was the computer. Um, larger portfolio investments where the funds are, we've actually had to completely restructure a lot of our portfolios so they don't, so our European clients don't hold anything in the UK and vice versa. Because if, in case of a no deal Brexit and a hard Brexit, um, passporting may disappear. Now, what passporting is, is the facility for someone that's licensed through, let's say, the FCA in the UK to do business in a country in Europe like Spain through the CNMV or through France or through whichever European 27 country. Now, if that disappears, 
those funds, those investment advisors, those um, financial advisors that are UK licensed, UK based, may not even be able to talk to their clients, let alone look after them. Um, and vice versa, if you've got a European IFA and you, you're in the UK, in, if passporting doesn't carry on uh, in such a way that it's going to benefit the client, it may just cease one day to the other. So this was one of the reasons uh, Tam actually opened an office in Europe. Me, me, luckily, being New Yorker is a very nice place to have it. Was that we could ring f fence everything within the EU so that our investment decisions were made from the EU, our custodianship of the money was made was held within the EU, um, our offices, our phone calls, our admin, our compliance, everything is done from the EU because it is a possibility, excuse me, I don't know if you can hear that, my computer going there, um, it is a possibility that when Brexit hits that that might just cease from one day to another so that I mean it would be basically like a Berlin Wall going up it, it would be disastrous for financial advisors that work from the UK with European clients and also with funds so you know if if you own I can't see it affecting UK stocks directly by clients but anything collective Anything that's managed, anything that's advised from the UK, um, so it's a very hard one to predict. But what we can predict is, from at least now to the end of January, it will be volatile because people markets work off fear. You know, fear is a big mover of markets, and while no one knows what's going to happen, it's going to create fear among the investors. So. To answer your question, I wish I knew. Um, all I can say for certain is it's uncertain. I know that doesn't really answer your question, but well, I guess you know. I mean, it sounds like everything right now. I mean, it's it's with with the lockdowns, the pandemics. People don't know what's happening one day to the next. You can wake up one morning and things will be one way. You wake up the next morning and things are another. Uh, and the same with Brexit. We don't know whether it's going to be a hard Brexit, whether or not they're going to reach some sort of deal. Although at this stage, it is looking highly unlikely. Um, so, I, you know, I guess the best advice that you could probably give to anybody is to make sure that your financial house is in order to ask these questions of your advisor now. Um, and if you're unhappy with the answers that that advisor you know provides you then perhaps find another advisor and see if you can transfer you know your investments over to somebody else um is if there is a hard brexit will there because i know that it, the european union has very very strong laws in regards to what you can and cannot do when you are a financial advisor um, Will those laws apply to Britain or will they go back to the way they used to be or will there be a change in law? That's a very good question. Um, the UK basically, so if we start at the top of Europe, you've got a thing called MIFID II, which is, they're not laws so much as guidelines. Uh, the guidelines that countries have to impose into their local legislation so that financial advisors follow the local legislation of the jurisdiction they're working within to protect the clients and to protect the products being sold to make sure it's correct for the client and to, to provide protection in case that is not withheld um, upheld now the uk itself has got rdr it's got the financial conduct authority I mean, don't forget, regulation is very new. Re regulation, UK was one of the first to come in with the banking regulation. That was only in 79. The FCA, which is the governing body, financial conduct authority in the UK, is only just 10 years old. So it could change very quickly, but with the UK, I would still say I am very sure it would be a very controlled in the same as Europe. It's not as if 
let's say one of the Channel Islands were to come out, then they might go a little bit away because they can then suddenly do a lot of things off piste, if you like, that they wouldn't do. But Britain as a whole has a huge sector of its GDP in finance. So I can't see it being coming ungoverned. It might be governed a little bit differently to MIFID 2 um, and the local guidelines that are imposed because of the MIFID 2. But if anything, I would probably say the UK would even get stricter because they'd have to then monitor what's happening, what's coming in cross border as well. Well, you know what? I mean, uh, everything is up in the air, as we said earlier. Um, I would suggest if you are a seafarer and you are a crew of any sort and are looking to invest um, and, and you do have a job, because those are sort of few and far in between these days, um, to check out Seafarer Savers uh, concept, because it is a good concept in the case that you become unemployed or injured, as you were saying earlier. Um, so definitely do check that out. And Tom, you know, I thank you again for your advice because every time you come on board, you're always, it's always great to sort of find out because people are scared, you know, people are scared about jobs, people are scared about their money, they're scared about their investments. Um, and it's always nice to be able to have somebody that everyone knows within the yachting industry say, you know what, it'll be okay, or it may not be, but. <laughs> I, I think the big thing to take away today is it's okay to be scared, even though it's a horrible feeling. I mean, even the FCA in the UK are telling people in the UK, because we have a UK office as well, they're telling us in the UK, be prepared. So we're going for what? I think, well, we don't know, but be prepared. Um, so all I can really do is mimic what they're saying is, you know, don't just hope for the best. You know, if, if you have got UK assets, or UK investments, look at, you know, if they can be transferred and how they can be transferred. Um, the only thing I, I can do to alleviate a little bit of fear is say they will probably, even with a hard Brexit, give some kind of uh, period of allowance where um, you'll be allowed to transfer assets over, for example, I don't know, six to 12 months would be likely you'd like to think but again it's uncertain but yeah the biggest thing i'd say would be have a backstop have a plan b just in case if you have got anything cross-border at all with the uk well tom thank you for your time we'll make sure to put your information below this interview in case anybody is in need of a new financial advisor or has any questions in regards to this interview i'm sure that you'd be more than willing to help well, uh, we don't give advice here. We manage money. Um, so unfortunately, we can't give financial advice, but um, we do have the Seafarer Saver where they can um, sign up for investments. And we do work with an array of advisors, uh, both with and, uh, within and with, uh, outside of the yachting industry that we can put you in touch with. Excellent. Well, and, and that's all they need, really. So that's good news. So yeah, we will provide your information. Thank you so much, Tom, for your time. Thank you, Ria. Once again, this has been Tom Worthington from TAM Asset Management. You've been watching another edition of Yacht Crew Vlogs right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I have been your host. Tune in again for another episode.